Church, you made it. The last Sunday of 2020. And I appreciate Pastor Chris's encouragement and admonition that we need to rejoice, right? There's a lot of good things to praise the Lord for in 2020. But at the same time, I don't think any of us wants to get to December 31st and see this happen, right? The year that never ends, right? We don't want that. We're ready. We're ready to move into the new year. So I'll bring a little humor. Thanks, Chris, for the maturity. Appreciate that. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, welcome. Uh, glad to have you here with us. Uh, my name is Nick Lees, and uh, you picked an interesting Sunday to join us at the very end of the year, but we're glad to have you. And, and what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be closing out our study of Matthew chapter 13. We've been, in, we've been in the Gospel of Matthew all year long, and today we are reaching the end of chapter 13. And we're going to take a break in the new year to study Colossians, and we'll get back into Matthew later in the, in the spring. But as we've been working through this gospel over the year, um, I hope that you've been seeing changes in your life, that you've allowed the truths of Jesus' teaching to soak in and to begin to, to work in you and to conform you to his image. And I thought it would be helpful for me to just share some of the key themes and lessons that I've been learning this year, the way the Lord's been at work in me, and, and perhaps it would stir some things up in you and you would say, oh yeah, I, God's been teaching me the same thing. Here's how he's been working in my life. And so as we've been in this gospel all year long, um, for me, the study has really helped me to go to deeper in my understanding of God's grand plan of redemption. You've heard me say that phrase over and over and over again, that God has this marvelous, beautiful, expansive, grand plan of redemption. And frankly, the study of Matthew has really helped me to just see that in its beauty even more um, and to be thankful for it, that it includes someone like me. Praise God for that. Um, I've also been growing in my appreciation for just the present reality of God's rule and reign, that he rules and reigns on our earth even right now, and, and that should provoke a response of submission and humility in my life, and especially in a year like 2020, even when I don't understand fully what the Lord is doing, I can say, God, your way is the best way. Sitting at the feet of Jesus to be able to listen and learn from the master himself on what it means to be a disciple and what it means to walk in righteousness has also been quite convicting. It makes me realize, God, I need you to work in me if I'm going to ever live up to this calling. Again, <laughs> producing hopefully humility in us, saying, Lord, I need you. I can't, I can't be this, this righteous one that you've called me and equipped me to be without you working and moving in me. And then we have, you know, Jesus healing illnesses, casting out demons, raising the dead, calming the sea, which provokes a sense of awe. Like, wow, he really is the Messiah. He really is the promised one, the Son of God, who has come to set his people free. And being able to see how many of the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, um, again, just evokes a sense of awe. Like, he is the Messiah. He is the promised one. Watching and seeing how the New Testament and Old Testament just support each other so beautifully gives me great confidence that this is God's word. No human authors could have done that on their own. God was over it and in it. It's a small sampling of some of the highlights and some of the themes that have been impactful to me this year. What about you? How has God been at work in your life through the study of the Gospel of Matthew this year? Are you stronger in your faith today, what is it, December 27th, than you were on January 1 of 2020? Has there been, been a growing sense of, of peace and calmness in your life as you've learned to sit at the feet of Jesus and trust the Lord in what he's doing? Those are some questions we can reflect on as the year comes to a close. Our goal is always to listen and learn, to be hearers and doers of the word, not just hearers only. And we've heard from Jesus' own mouth in the study of this gospel that there will be many who say to him, Lord, Lord, and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Our life uh, can't be taken lightly. Our faith certainly must not be taken lightly. We can't play at having faith. Our choices in this life have real eternal consequences. There's great joy when we choose to walk with the Lord and to follow his will and his ways for our lives. And there's great sorrow 
when we choose to walk in a path of rejecting the Lord and doing what's right in our own eyes. And so I wanted to start our time today before we get into the study of the word, just by taking some time to reflect, which I, I hadn't talked with DJ. We didn't coordinate that of, of planning to reflect, but it's just the nature of ending a year, right? We tend to spend some time thinking about what, what has this year produced? What has happened in my life this year? We naturally want to look back and evaluate, just as we're looking forward now with hope and anticipation. What will the new year bring? How do I want to continue to grow and change as I pursue the Lord? And then this is also the time of year when we're typically spending more time with our family and our friends, whether you have time off of work or you're traveling for the holidays. Perhaps you're watching online right now from another state with family. A lot of people are, are with their family. They're with their friends. Our, our family has the privilege of hitting the road tomorrow to go see my family in Indiana, and we're excited about that. But these times of the year provide some interesting ministry opportunities when we're with our family and our friends. You go home or you go visit folks. You're, you're around people you don't see very often, your parents, your siblings, right, cousins, aunts, uncles. Maybe you get together with your old high school buddies, your college friends. It's your once or twice in a year opportunity to catch up and hopefully to also be intentional to minister to them. They're important opportunities. And what we're going to study today in the Gospel of Matthew is going to show that those are often our hardest ministry opportunities, the, the family and the friend relationships. Those can be some of the most difficult and challenging ministry moments. So go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles and open up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be in the last five verses of the or last six verses, math is hard, <laughs> verses 53 to 58 of the, of the chapter, Matthew chapter 13. That's page 478 of the Blue Bibles, if you grabbed one of those on your way in. Now, this is going to be a short passage, but it is packed with significance for both Jesus' ministry back then and our ministry uh, to our family and friends today. So let's read. We're going to start in verse 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables... He went away from there. Okay, we're going to stop for a second. Jesus has just finished teaching the great crowds. Remember, he's on the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds are around him, and he's been teaching them in parables. That's done now, and he's on his way home. Right? He's going to go visit his family. And maybe it would be helpful to remember the, the geography of the area. Um, first, we'll start with Nazareth down here on the, on the left. Right, that's Jesus' hometown. That's where he grew up. Spent 30 years of his life there, the son of a carpenter, learning to work with his hands, working at the skill and the craft of carpentry, and before eventually moving 20 miles to the northeast to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. And he spent, that was like his home base. That's where he spent most of his ministry um, before moving to Jerusalem where he was crucified, which we're not going to talk about that today. We'll get to that later in Matthew. But he spent most of his time in Capernaum uh, ministering around the Sea of Galilee. And that's what Matthew's gospel up to this point has been focused on. So we've been studying about and learning about all year long. But now he's going home. What do you think is going to happen when he visits home? Right, Jesus has been healing. He's been performing mighty miracles. He's raised the dead. Right? Great crowds have been listening to him. What happens when the Messiah goes home to visit his family in his hometown? Let's, let's keep reading in verses 54 through 58. It says, In coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Tough crowd, right? Tough crowd. They're not interested in who Jesus claims to be. They hear his teaching and they're astonished by it. They see some of his mighty works and it provokes a response in them. But this is the carpenter's son to them. If they had just known how big the crowds were the day before on the Sea of Galilee, 
is this not the carpenter's son? They're astonished. But that astonishment does not lead to belief. It doesn't produce faith in them. Instead, it hardens their hearts. Astonished unbelief. And Jesus acknowledges that it's hardest to minister in your own hometown with your own family. Which I think is a fascinating observation for the sa- from the Savior. And frankly, uh, with it being holiday season and the time when we're around family and friends and often visiting our hometown, it's probably good for us to spend some time thinking about that. Considering what do we need to learn from Jesus' example here. And so as we dig into the word, I want to talk with you about two challenges when ministering to your family and friends. Two challenges when ministering to your family and friends. And let's see what we can learn from Jesus' experience. Here's the first challenge that you've got to be aware of. Getting past their preconceptions. Getting past their preconceptions. That's our big word for the day, preconceptions. What does that mean? Right? You can't get past them if you don't know what the word means. So let's define it. A preconception is a preconceived idea or prejudice. A preconceived idea or prejudice. It's the idea that, um, in this case, people from your past believe that they know who you are. Right? They have this idea about this is the type of man or the type of woman that you are. They've already formed their opinions about you. And that's clearly what happens when Jesus goes back home to Nazareth. His family, his friends, his hometown view him in a particular light. They have preconceptions about him. This is the carpenter's son. And for some of them, that's all he'll ever be. I think we can understand that type of response. How many of us have gone to a family reunion only to have that aunt come up and be like, I remember you when you were this tall, right? They pinch your cheek and do one of those. How many of us go back home and spend time with our old buddies and uh, we get right back into the old topics of your favorite hobbies or those memories of the dumb things you did when you were kids. But you're 30 or 40 or in your 50s or 60s, and, and you've all grown many years since then, and there's lots more to talk about that are much more significant, but you just never move past those things in the past. Or who hasn't gone home and tried to minister to a family member only to have them throw it back in your face? Like, how dare you try to talk to me about God? Because they know what your past was like. They know the old man or the old woman that you used to be. Does your soul ache to be able to minister to people like that? To share the hope that you have with your your loved ones, with your friends that you grew up with? To discuss eternally significant matters? To move past that memory from when you were in your teens to what God is doing in your life today? I hope that that's the the beat of our heart. I hope that's what we want to do. Right as we just sang, it's, it's your breath in our lungs so we'll pour out our praises. Let's not just do that on a Sunday morning with people we know agree with us. Let's do that with our loved ones and our family and our friends and our hometown. But we've got to realize they're often predisposed to think of us in a particular light. Oh, nothing's changed in him. She's still the same as when I remember her. That's what Jesus experiences. Right? He'd lived with them for 30 years. And he's only been gone for a year or so. We have to remember that. He'd been with them for 30 years, the majority of his life. He's been gone for a year or so. And yet, so much has changed in that time. He is on mission from his Father in heaven. He is calling people to repent and believe for the kingdom is at hand. And he's performed many mighty miracles. He's raised the dead, calmed the sea, healed many, cast out demons. And yeah, they got to hear some of his wise teachings. They got to see some of his mighty works, but that wasn't enough for them. What what did they say? Is this not the carpenter's son? Where did this man get his wisdom and mighty works? (laughs) This man. No titles. No respect. They are not interested in and who Jesus claims to be. They are questioning his authority, questioning the source of his authority, just like we've heard before from the Pharisees and from the crowds. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? 
Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? But they're saying, we know this guy. He grew up here. His family is still here. He's not the Messiah. Who does he think he is to try to teach us? Did you know that even Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him until after the resurrection? We get to read a little bit about his relationship with them in John chapter 7. It recounts this interaction between Jesus and his brothers. They're trying to goad him into doing something that wasn't what God wanted him to do at that point. They are saying, hey, look, if you're truly the Messiah, then go public with it. Tell everyone, you need to prove that you're the Messiah by going public. And Jesus knows it's not my time to do so. Here's a couple of the verses that record this interaction from John 7, verses 4 and 5. The brothers are saying to him, For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Right? His brothers want him to prove it. Prove to us that you're who you really say you are, that you're the Messiah. And then we get this helpful little note in verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. Not even his brothers believed in him. And in fact, we see them taunting him in their unbelief. Now the good news is, is that we read later in the, in the book of Acts chapter 1 that they have a change of heart and a change of faith. In Acts 1, we hear that Mary and the brothers of Jesus are waiting with the disciples in the upper room. That after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, they do believe. In fact, um, both James and Judas end up being a significant part of the early church. And both are responsible for writing part of our New Testament. You could probably guess what James wrote. It's the letter to James, of James, rather. And then uh, Judas wrote the letter of Jude. So God worked in their hearts to convict them and bring them to a faith in Christ. But it took Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for that to happen. Initially, they were quite hostile to the gospel. They were stuck in their unbelief. That's his family. That's, that's the people that are closest to him. Ministry, ministry to family and friends comes with deep challenges. It's often hard for them to get past their preconceptions of you, who they believe you to be. You're stuck in one spot in their brain. And as you consider that, as you think about you know, Jesus' example, if this, is the, if this is the trouble that he had as he ministered to his family and friends, what does that mean for people like you and me? I think it means that things are going to be a whole lot more difficult for us. Right? Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He was a sinless man. I know my mom would have loved to have a sinless son. Sorry, Mom, if you're listening to this, I apologize, right? I was not a sinless child, and neither were you. What I'm trying to say is there's a whole lot that made Jesus stand out that makes us stand out from our family and friends. And yet they didn't believe in him. And now, as Jesus is with them, he's performing miracles. He's revealing divine wisdom that he wasn't taught by any human teacher you're not performing miracles when you go home. You're not revealing divine wisdom that no one ever taught you. But there is a lot that set Jesus apart from his family and friends, and there's not a whole lot at times that sets us apart. So when you visit with them, it's frankly understandable that they would struggle with getting past those preconceptions, especially if they're you know, expecting, well, you're the same that you've always been. For people who don't have faith in Christ, they don't really have a category for understanding the transforming work of Jesus in you. They, they don't get it that you have changed, that God has changed you, that you're not the same as you always were. And they're going to be tempted to respond or to limit their, their response by their own understanding, to limit their faith by their own understanding. If I can't explain it, it must not be real. But that's Nick. That's the guy who played video games all day long. Like, he's never going to amount to anything. That's Michaela. Do you remember how much she partied? She wanted to be a successful businesswoman. Where do you think she's at now? Is this not the carpenter's son? And you've got to prepare yourself 
to move past those preconceptions, to get past them, which is going to take intentionality. Right? You're going to have to be intentional to direct the conversations to what God has done in you and through you. To him be the glory. To share the extravagant grace that you've been given. You're right. That's who I once was. But that's not who I am anymore. Can I tell you about the great transforming work of Jesus in my life? God has done a work in me. I want to encourage you to think about what would it look like for you to be on mission in your conversations this holiday season? To be intentional to direct or redirect at times the conversation to a more spiritually intentional and edifying conversation. Rather than going back down the, the comfortable and familiar conversation paths of talking about your hobbies, or talking about so-and-so in the family, or even just lamenting like, man, 2020, huh, what a year, and going down that path. What if we talk about, well, let me share with you how God's been at work in me this year. Can I tell you about what God has been teaching me, how he's been uh, frankly, confronting me and growing me this year? I would argue that those conversations are lower-hanging fruit now more than ever. That when we walk through a season of suffering corporately, right, worldwide suffering in 2020, that that provides an opportunity to engage in some intentional, spiritually-minded conversations. But as you're intentional to engage in those conversations, don't be surprised when what you receive back is opposition or pushback. Again, there's lots of preconceptions working against you and against the gospel. Jesus is facing it here firsthand. His hometown doesn't get it. How can this man, the carpenter's son, have these mighty works and, and this wisdom? Where did he get these things? And they're not asking those questions because they want answers. They don't go on to investigate. They write them off. If I can't understand it, it must not be true. They're unwilling to listen and believe. So you've got to imagine for them, they're also struggling with their preconceptions of what the Messiah would be like. That's who Jesus is claiming to be. And remember, the Jewish people want a Messiah who is going to be a political leader, someone who's going to uh, conquer and overthrow Rome. Put them back in their rightful place. They were likely expecting him to be more akin to a Pharisee, one who comes and, you know, is an Old Testament expert and holds people to the law. They couldn't reconcile that concept, what they wanted, with the carpenter's son that stood before them, saying, I am the Messiah. And not much has really changed since Jesus walked the earth. These same kind of arguments are still given today. You're still going to uh, butt up against faith being limited by human understanding. Right? If I can't explain it, then it must not be true. Right? Okay, well, show me a miracle. Then I'll believe. Well, the Messiah, he must look this way. He must act this way. And in those interactions, in those relationships with your family and friends, the goal, the mission is still the same to be a faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ. And I love how Paul puts it in his letter to the Corinthians. It's a familiar passage. We hit this one from time to time, but here it is again, 2 Corinthians 5. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What good news. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. If you have been rescued and redeemed from sin, if, if you are in Christ, meaning you've been united to him through faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, this is your calling. This is what you've been entrusted with, being an ambassador for him. 
imploring your family, your friends, those in your hometown, be reconciled to Jesus to call the world to repent and believe in him. That's your mission. Will you choose to accept it? We also see Peter imploring the Christians of his day, Christians who were facing persecution, who were suffering. He calls them to be faithful as well. Let me share what, what he says. 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's what we're called to. So if you're in Christ this morning, you are to honor Christ the Lord in your heart as holy. Right? You're to soak in the holiness of the Lord, to allow it to, to be precious to you and to transform you, to drive you to live in a holy, joy-filled way. So much so that people would look at you and say, whoa, what's different about you? Why do you have hope? And it's just so that you'll be prepared to make a defense or to present a reason to anyone, anyone who asks you, hey, why are you so filled with hope right now? How can you be joyful in the midst of what we're going through? Or Peter's assuming that there's something different about Christians. Our hope is unshakable. It can't be taken from us. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Is that what your family and friends are going to see this holiday season as you're with them? That you have a joy that cannot be taken from you. That it's unshakable no matter what trials and tribulations you've been through this year. And remember, the, the Christians of those days were facing persecution by the Romans. Death was a, was a reality for them. Your joy, your hope can shine so, so bright this holiday season. And if your family sees that, it's going to be really hard for them to deny the evidence of Christ in you. It doesn't mean it will be impossible. We see it with Jesus' hometown, right? They are still willing to be stubborn and, and stay in their unbelief. But if you have that joy and you're showing that joy and that hope, it's going to invite some questions. And as your joy and your hope opens those doors with your family and friends, I want to encourage you, take those opportunities. Look for ways to speak to them in a way that shares that hope that you have. Invite them to consider the truth of Christ and what he's done. To repent and believe in Jesus. And take it from Peter's teaching here. Don't let this be an opportunity for you to prove that you're right. right? Can't you see I'm right and you're wrong? No. Always be ready to present a defense and gentleness, and respect. That's the demeanor that we're to conduct ourselves as Christians. With gentleness and respect. God is the one who does the convicting. So you can let him do that. Your job is to be faithful to share the gospel. So there's our first challenge with ministering to family and friends. It's getting past their preconceptions. Here's our second one. Familiarity leads to stumbling. Familiarity leads to stumbling. And these two uh, challenges are tied hand in hand. Because the first challenge addresses their preconceptions about you. This challenge addresses the results of those preconceptions. Because they're familiar, it leads to stumbling. And this is what happens with Jesus' hometown in verses 57 and 58. I'll read those real quick again. So they respond with all of those questions and in verse 57, we read, they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They took offense at Jesus. Now, the word for took offense is scandalizo. And it means that they were brought to a downfall, that they were led into sin. 
Jesus' teachings, his mighty works in front of them led to their stumbling. It led to their downfall. Not that he caused it, but that that was the opportunity for their downfall and their sin to be revealed. They chose to take offense at Jesus. They saw the evidence and they said, no, I will not believe. There's a progression in the verses. They're astonished at first. Like, whoa, something's different here. But then they're skeptical. Who is this man? Is this not the carpenter's son? Don't we know his family? They begin casting doubt on the source of his power and the source of his authority. And what we see is this progression of rejection. Now the truth is revealed. Hey, uh, we're not interested in hearing what you have to say. We don't believe. They take offense. And as they do that, they've now put themselves in a very dangerous place. They've lumped themselves in with the cities of Chorazon and Bethsaida uh, and Capernaum, who Jesus rebuked earlier in the Gospel of Matthew for failing to have faith when he called them to repent and believe. These people were eyewitnesses, right? They'd known Jesus his entire life. But their preconceptions and their familiarity with him blinded them. They weren't able to see clearly. They couldn't get past his humanity to see his divinity. Which I think shows how incredibly human Jesus really was. Right? For 30 years, he'd been in their town, living amongst them, practicing as a carpenter. Then he moves away goes into public ministry, and comes back, and yet everyone thinks he's just like us. There's nothing different about him. They can't reconcile that divine nature with their understanding of who Jesus is, which leads them to have no faith. Again, you have to realize what that implies for you and me today is it's going to be even harder in our ministry to our family and friends because we got nothing that sets us apart in the sense of we're not sinless, we're not performing mighty works or um, showing these amazing things that Jesus was teaching. Right? There is an old man in my past. There is an old woman or old man in your past that our family, our friends know about. They've experienced it firsthand. And the enemy loves to use that to cloud their understanding, to distract them from hearing the truth of the gospel. So let's say you are home for the holidays and you are getting some time with your old high school buddy, your old college buddy, right? And they say, don't talk to me about that stuff. I know what you were like in college. Or you try to share with your, your sister or your brother who you see is going down a, a dangerous path. <laughs> who are you to talk to me? Do you remember how you treated me as a kid? Why would I listen to you? Or maybe you're trying to minister to your own parent. Show some respect. I raised you. How dare you talk to me about these matters? Those are real challenges that we will face in these interactions, in these types of ministry relationships. And we've got to be ready to address them. We've heard this over and over again over the last few weeks. There is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. And I hope that all of us would say, I don't want, I don't want hell for my family or for my friends, for my hometown. I love these people. We've got to be willing to endure the opposition that they bring, the, the maybe persecution, persecution that they bring, the suffering that is brought in, in order to love them well. Which is going to require a lot of humility, a lot of dying to self, being willing to admit, you know what? You're right. <laughs> there are some things in my past that I need to address with you. There was a uh, a time where I, I sinned against you. And as appropriate, owning that and asking for their forgiveness if you've never done that. Address those objections in humility, not defensiveness. Don't, uh, there's no use in getting angry about the, the past being thrown in your face. That's not going to accomplish anything. But humility and seeking to love them and seeking to, to remove those obstacles to hearing the gospel will go a long way towards providing that ministry opportunity. Remember, we're to answer with gentleness and respect. I think another thing that's very helpful for us in this type of ministry is to remember the sovereignty of God, which again is another topic we've hit on a lot lately because it is like the most important doctrine in Scripture, one of the most important, that God is over all, that he's in control. And so that is encouraging because if we open our mouth and share the gospel, God's sovereignty means he will do with that what he wills. 
And he has promised that he will save some. That that seed that's sown, some of it will be on good soil, which will respond and produce a fruitful harvest. And if you have people in your life that reject you, remember that they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. And God is not surprised by that either. It's a hard truth, but one that is helpful to remember is that God's plan may not be for salvation for that person. We, we read about that in Romans chapter 9. I'm not going to read Romans 9 to you this morning, but we read in Romans 9 that God is glorified in both those who are repentant and follow him and those who are unrepentant and don't follow him. He's glorified in the former by showing them grace and mercy, inviting them to be a part of his family. And he's glorified in the latter by showing his righteousness and wrath and judgment. Those are some hard truths, right? Those are some hard realities to chew on. We care about and we love our family and our friends. We don't want hell for any of them. But God will have his glory one way or another. And we see here in verse 58, Jesus' teaching, his mighty works, ultimately leads them to unbelief. And he judges them for their unbelief. They had hard hearts, and so he responds by not doing many miracles for them. Jesus is not a traveling show. He's not there to put on some kind of entertaining spectacle with his miracles. He's there to call them to repent and believe. And we have seen throughout the Gospel of Matthew that the people that Jesus responds to are those who come to him in faith. He delights to answer those who come to him in faith. And I'm just going to walk us through a couple of of the examples that we've seen in just chapters 8 and 9 alone of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, It's been a while since we've been in these, but we had the leper. You may remember the leper who came to Christ, and he wasn't supposed to. He's unclean, not supposed to approach anyone, but he had faith that Jesus could heal him. And so he comes, and he asks Jesus to heal him, and Jesus responds by healing him. We have the centurion who had a, a servant who was paralyzed comes to Jesus and asks for for mercy for his servant. And Jesus responds by healing his servant. There are many who come to Jesus when he's residing in Peter's mother's home, and they're coming with demons, they're coming with sicknesses and illnesses, and Jesus responds by healing them and casting out the demons. Then you've got the paralytic, you've got Jairus and his daughter, you've got the bleeding woman, all people who are in desperate need of help, and they come to Jesus, and they say, Lord, help us. And time and again, he responds by answering their request. Faith is the expected response to the kingdom of God. It's the only appropriate response. Unbelief leads to condemnation. So as you're out and about over the next few weeks, with family, with friends, visiting folks. Be intentional to call people to faith, faith that leads to repentance. Be intentional to share how uh, God has worked in your life. Call them to to get over their preconceptions of, of who you once were or who they believe that Jesus even is. Help them to understand who he truly is and what he's done in you. Try to remove those obstacles and those barriers to the gospel message so that you can then be faithful to share the gospel. That assumes that you know the gospel and know it well enough to share it. That if we're going to be able to come alongside of our family members, if we're going to come alongside of our friends and give them the hope that we have, we have to be able to articulate it. And I want to encourage you uh, to spend some time in your life, not just thinking about, well, how would I do that with others? But just to be meditating on the gospel for your own sake, for your own edification. And as you do that, as you allow the gospel truths to influence you, guess what? Then you'll be in a position to speak of that to your family members, to your friends, to your loved ones, to the people you're interacting with. So my encouragement to you as part of your homework is to carve out some time for yourself or if you're a parent for your whole family to just be still and to remember gospel truths, to meditate on what God has done in your life, but to worship him. It is so easy, and I found this in my own life over the last week, to be busy with presents, to be busy with sugary sweets, 
right, to be busy with all sorts of noise, not necessarily bad things, but to stop, not stop and, and really reflect on who Christ is and what he's done in me and to worship him for it. That's the challenge during this time of the year. We're so focused on all the other things that we don't slow down and focus on the main thing. So what I want to do before we leave today is just practice rehearsing the gospel. And so if you've been around here, you've, you've heard this framework. I'm going to put up a framework. Um, it's four words. God, man, Christ, response. God, man, Christ, response. Four words that are meant to capture the essentials of the gospel message. Who God is who we are in light of who God is and why we have a sin problem and what that means, God's solution, his son Jesus Christ, and the necessity of a response to God's solution. And those, that's a f- helpful framework. What I want to do, though, is I want to actually share an extended reading from one of my favorite books, which you've heard about recently, A Gospel Primer. In the middle section of this book, um, the author, Milton Vincent, takes some time to rehearse the gospel truths for his own sake, for his own edification, and for the praise of the Lord. And so I'm going to read this for us today. I don't normally read books from the pulpit, but this is, is like a devotional. It's, a, it's an opportunity to worship. So I want to encourage you to just kind of sit back, maybe close your eyes so other things are not distracting you, and just consider the truths of the gospel again and what it means for you. Here we go. My God is immense beyond imagination. He measured the entire universe with merely the span of his hand. He is unimaginably awesome in all of his perfections, absolutely righteous, holy, and just in all of his ways. He has also been unbelievably good and merciful to me as the creator and sustainer of my life. Every breath, every heartbeat, Every function of every organ in my body is a gift from him. Every legitimate pleasure I experience is a gift from his loving hand to me. All that I am and all that I have, I owe to him and to his goodness. My life in every way is and will continue to be utterly dependent upon him in whom I live and move and have my being. This wonderful God is the most supremely worthy object of admiration, honor, and delight in all of the universe. And he has created me with the intention that I might glorify him by finding my soul's delight in him and by living in joyful obedience to him in all of my ways. Yet I could not have failed this great God more miserably than I have. Instead of giving thanks to him and humbly submitting to his rule over my life, I have rebelled against him and have actually sought to exalt myself above him. Going my own way and living according to my own wisdom, I have broken countless times either the letter or the spirit of every one of God's Ten Commandments. Thinking myself to be wise, I have shown myself to be a fool. And because of my arrogance, God has every right to damn me to the everlasting experience of his terrifying wrath in the lake of fire. So as for myself, apart from Christ, I am bound by the guilt of my sins and also bound by the power of sin, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Apart from Christ, I am also utterly deserving of and destined for eternal punishment in the lake of fire completely unable to save myself or even to make one iota of a contribution to my own salvation. However, what I could not do, God did. And in doing it, he did it all, sending his own son into the world to die on the cross for my sins, thereby showing me unfathomable love. God loved me so much that he was willing to suffer the loss of his son, And even more amazingly, he was willing to allow his son to suffer the loss of him at the cross. Jesus loved me so much that he was willing to lay down his life for me. No one could ever love me more or better than Jesus. On the third day after Jesus' death, God raised him from the dead, thereby announcing that his death was completely sufficient to atone for every sin that I have or will commit throughout my lifetime. God then exalted Christ to his own right hand, 
where Christ now reigns from on high, granting salvation and forgiveness to all who call on him by faith. Now when my time came and I placed my faith in Jesus, God instantly granted me a great salvation. He forgave me of all my sins, past, present, and future. He made me his child, adopted me into his family. He gave me the gift of the Holy Spirit, who gives me God's power, who pours out God's love within my heart, and who tenderly communicates to my spirit that I am a child of God and an heir of eternal glory in heaven. In saving me, God also freed me from slavery to any and all sins. I no longer have to sin again, for sin's mastery over me has been broken. In saving me, God also justified me. And being justified through Christ, I have a peace with God that will endure forever. In justifying me, God declared me innocent of my sins and pronounced me righteous with the very righteousness of Jesus. God also allowed his future and present wrath against me to be completely propitiated by Jesus, who bore it upon himself while on the cross. Consequently, God now has only love, compassion, and deepest affection for me. And this love is without any admixture of wrath whatsoever. God always looks upon me and treats me with gracious favor, always working all things together for my ultimate and eternal good. God's grace abounds to me even through trials. Because I am a justified one, he subjugates every trial and forces it to do good unto me. And when I sin... God's grace abounds to me all the more as he graciously maintains my justified status as described above. When I sin, God feels no wrath in his heart against me. His heart is filled with nothing but love for me. And he longs for me to repent and confess my sins to him so that he might show me the gracious and forgiving love that has been in his heart all along. God does not require my confession before he desires to forgive me. In his heart, he has already forgiven me. And when I come to him to confess my sins to him, he runs to me, as it were, and is repeatedly embracing and kissing me even before I get the words of confession out of my mouth. The author is taking from the parable of the prodigal son from Luke 15 there for that imagery. God does see my sins, and he is grieved by my sins. His grief comes partly from the fact that in my moments of sin... I'm not receiving the fullness of his love for me. He even sends chastisement into my life, but he does so because he is for me, and he loves me, and he disciplines me for my ultimate good. I don't deserve any of this, even on my best day, but this is my salvation, and herein I stand. Thank you, Jesus. I love that meditation on the gospel. That has been a a balm to my soul for many years as I rehearse those truths. And I hope you heard it in there, right? Starting with God and who he is. And then getting to who are we in light of a holy God. And then what he has done through Christ, bringing us to himself, making a way for us. And the glorious hope that we have as we respond to that in faith. The hope of heaven, the hope of forgiveness of our sins. I hope that that encourages your soul this morning. That as you chew on and meditate on the truths of the gospel for your life, that then puts you in a position to to go and to tell others about the hope that you have, about what Christ has done in you. That as you go and you spend time with your family and your friends, that you would be intentional to minister to them. And as you get ready to do that, I want to encourage you to be fervent in your prayer. Right, to beg the Lord, God, please move in me. Please help me not to fear man. Please help me not to be content with just keeping things at the status quo. Work in me to be bold in my faith, to share what you've done. And Lord, please work in them. Give them ears to hear and a heart to believe. Right, beg the Lord to work and to act. Ask him to overcome those obstacles, their preconceptions, their familiarity, the things that lead to stumbling in their life. And I also want to encourage you, don't give up. I know of a man uh, from my last church who, for 40 years, prayed for and was intentional to minister to one of his college buddies. And it was in year 40 that his college buddy finally bowed the knee and trusted in Christ. 
don't give up. Don't grow weary as your family or your friends continue to rebuff you and, and say, nope, that's not for me. You may believe that, but that's not what I believe. Keep pressing on. Can I close in prayer and pray over these interactions that we have in the days ahead? Jesus, we just come before you right now, and we pray that we would be faithful to you, faithful as ambassadors of Christ, calling this, this broken and hurting world to the hope of heaven, to the, the hope of being an adopted son or daughter of God. Lord, uh, we know that. Uh, who are we to, to share that message? We are needy sinners who were given the grace that you have provided to bring us into your family. We're not talking to our family or our friends as as people who have it all together. We're not talking down to them as if we're right and they're wrong. God, we come as humble, meek and mild, rescued and redeemed sinners who just want to point them to the hope that we have, the hope of forgiveness, the hope of salvation, the hope of a, of a joy-filled life, one that's eternally significant here and now and also into eternity. Would you please, Lord, Help us to be faithful to just chew on these truths so that when we are around these folks, that we would love them enough to open our mouths and share the hope that we have with them. Lord, I pray that you would be preparing us and equipping us, that you would be um, removing the obstacles that are, that are likely in place towards hearing and believing. And God, would you help us to be faithful time and time again even when we're rebuffed, even when we're rejected for sharing your gospel. I pray that you do this in my life as I get ready to head to, to Indiana with my family and friends. And I pray you do this with everyone here and those who are listening online, wherever they're at in their ministry right now. To you be the glory, Lord. You are so worthy of praise. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and worship.